Hello, everybody, and welcome to Des Moines University's Mini Medical School, week number three. What has the COVID-19 pandemic taught us about public health and prevention behaviors by Dr. Rochelle Reimer? I'm so happy to have you here with us. If you are just joining in for the first time, my name is Hannah DeGeest. I am the Community and Public Affairs Manager at Des Moines University, and I am your host for Mini Med School. And if you are tuning back in and you've already been with us, for the first few weeks. Welcome back. I am glad to see you again. I'm glad that you are joining in on this session as well. So before I introduce Dr. Reimer, I just want to share a little bit more about Des Moines University. Every week I've been sharing a few tidbits, um, a few pieces of information just to help you get to know Des Moines University better. So this week, I'm gonna share about our Department of Public Health. And that department consists of two academic programs one of which is the MPH degree, and that is a Master's of Public Health. And I have to admit, I'm a little partial to this degree because I am a student in that program um, and as well as an employee at Des Moines University. So not only do we have that program, we also have our MHA program, which is the Master's of Healthcare Administration. And the cool thing about these degrees is that they're 100% online. So you can really, pace yourself the way you want to do a course um, within a semester. Maybe you are a full-time working individual. Maybe you have other obligations during the week and you really want to do things just virtually. You're not able to come to class. Well, this is a great option for you. And I can attest to the program because, again, I'm a student in it myself. Um, I've learned so much and expanded my knowledge in public health. And um, the faculty really does an amazing job. It's something that they all care about deeply, and it's very evident in their teaching. And you will learn that a little bit as I introduce Dr. Reimer, as she is the director of both of these programs. Um, so without any further ado, I will introduce her to you today. So. Rochelle Reimer, PhD, is an associate professor in the chair of the Department of Public Health at Des Moines University. Additionally, she currently serves as the program director for both the CEPH accredited MPH program as well as the CAHME accredited MHA program. Prior to leading the faculty, staff, and students in the Department of Public Health at DMU, Dr. Reimer served as an assistant professor in the MPH program and taught courses on social and behavioral sciences, research methods, intervention science, and maternal and child health. Dr. Reimer's public health research has covered a number of topics, including healthy eating, healthy eating and exercise among families, HPV vaccination behaviors, racial, ethnic disparities in smoking behaviors and beliefs, and more recently examining epigenetic markers among tobacco users. Dr. Reimer obtained her bachelor's of science from the University of Iowa and her master's and PhDs from Iowa State University in the Department of Psychology. Welcome, Dr. Reimer, and thanks for joining us. Hello, and welcome to this presentation. My name is Rochelle Reimer, and I currently work here at Des Moines University as the chair of the Department of Public Health. In that role, I have the privilege of serving as the program director for the Master of Public Health program and the program director for the Master of Healthcare Administration program. My daily work is really centered on the students, faculty, and colleagues who are working to improve the health of patients and communities in Iowa and across the country. I also think I bring a unique perspective to this mini medical series in that my background and training is actually in the area of psychology. I was trained as a social psychologist and my work has been largely focused on understanding more about the decisions that individuals make about their health. I've been asked to speak with you today about COVID-19, and as you all know, COVID-19 has impacted each and every one of us in a myriad of ways. So given how broad the impact is and how pervasive that impact has been, I decided to do um, something of a traveling tour and just touch on a few highlights in areas that I thought um, would be interesting to this audience and where I thought I might be able to shed some light. I know we have a broad audience with us today, so I'm going to be pulling from academic, economic and industry related articles to illustrate my main objectives. I may also throw in a personal anecdote or a meme just to keep things fun and interesting. So I'm so glad you're here with me today and I'm really honored to be able to speak with you and I hope that you learn something from our time together today. What I'm hoping that we are able to cover is going to be centered around these three learning objectives. 
Like I said, I've spent a fair amount of time trying to narrow down some of the topics in which the COVID-19 pandemic has had an influence on human behavior, which is obviously a very broad topic. So I want to first acknowledge that this is just the tip of the iceberg. So much more research is emerging and will be coming out to help us have a more full understanding of how this pandemic has influenced human health behavior. And so with that, I'm gonna focus on these three things. First, I'm gonna give us a little background just on the emergence and the timeline of the COVID, the SARS-CoV-2 virus and how that has resulted in the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm gonna focus most of my time talking about how our behaviors have changed as a result of this pandemic and address a little bit of what psychologists call fundamental social needs. So that is where I'll be talking about a little bit today and I will promise that no matter how dreary the COVID-19 data or research might look, I promise to end on a high note. So the first question um, that I recently addressed in a talk that I gave to a physician's group was to talk about the origin and the spread of the virus. And so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about that, but I do wanna give a little bit of background and history just so we're all starting on the same page. So the virus first emerged in the Wuhan, China area um, and was linked to um, a food market in that region. But on December 31st, the country notified the World Health Organization of a pneumonia of unknown etiology. So very early on, we didn't know what this was, what was causing this illness, but there had been cases of a pneumonia-like illness of unknown etiology or of unknown origin. But by January 20th of 2020, there had been 282 confirmed cases in the countries of China, Thailand, Japan, and the Republic of Korea. On January 21st, 2020, the World Health Organization issued its first situation report number one. And what is important to know about the origin of this virus is that we are fairly confident that the virus emerged in or around the marketplace in Wuhan, China, although we cannot confirm exactly where it came from. But the virus features share a lot of similarity with other coronaviruses that we're aware of. There are three well-known coronaviruses that cause illness in humans, SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2, and MERS, which you may be familiar with from prior outbreaks. These viruses all share similar features to one another, but what's unique about the SARS-CoV-2 virus, of course, is the unique protein spike um, that enables it to um, infiltrate the human, um, the human body and make the illness very severe for us. There have been questions about whether or not this virus could have um, escaped from a laboratory or had come from another source of malicious intent. And the recent genetic research based on DNA analyses and, um, and um, modeling studies both confirm that while we cannot determine the exact origin of the virus, exactly which animal it may have originated from, most likely from a bat species in that region, it is, we're fairly confident that the features of the virus are not similar enough to known genetic back, viral backbones um, that it would have come from a source other than a natural origin in that area. So there are still many questions that will be answered, but um, I think it's important that we all have a similar understanding that the origin of the virus appears to be through natural selection um, and most likely coming from a bat species in China, but we don't know exactly where yet and research is ongoing to determine that. So how did the spread of the virus occur and what was the timeline? You may have heard friends or family talk about how they believe they had the coronavirus very early on before we had our first confirmed case. And we won't probably ever know the exact answer to that question, but there is some recent research that sheds some light on the timing of when that virus first emerged in the United States. So a recent research article that was just published this past year was done by conducting serological testing of routine blood donations from December 13th, 2019 through January 17th of 2020. And all of this is prior to the first confirmed case in the United States. The samples that were collected were collected through routine blood donations of people who gave their blood and for purposes of medical use or for purposes of research. And the American Red Cross had reserved these samples for a future research study 
completely unrelated to this actual study that ended up being done. They collected approximately 7,400 blood samples as part of these regular donations, and they were originally reserved for another purpose, but they decided to examine whether or not there was evidence of the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, being present in these samples. So the, the samples from California, Oregon, and Washington were from December 13th through the 19th, and then the rest of them were through January 17th in states like California, Connecticut, Iowa, Massachusetts, Michigan, Oregon, Rhode Island, Washington, and Wisconsin. So it's important. this is important because these were blood samples taken all across the United States in a short period of time, all prior to when the coronavirus was first confirmed in the United States. And through some complicated testing, they were able to confirm that about 1.4% of the samples were confirmed and highly likely to be the result of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, they cannot confirm that these were all SARS-CoV-2 virus infections, um, but it's also very unlikely that of these samples that these 106 positive samples were all by chance alone. What's, in, what's interesting is that one of the samples was actually from a participant in uh, Massachusetts who had recently experienced illness but had not traveled anywhere internationally. And so this suggests that the virus was here in the United States before we were aware of it, and it also suggests that there was some level of community spread before we were aware of it. And so while the first confirmed case occurred in January in the United States, there is pretty strong evidence that the virus was here at least in a small percentage of cases um, before we were aware of it. Um, so if you, have, if you have that question of whether or not someone you know may have had it prior to, um, we don't know exactly when it emerged, but we think there's evidence that it was here at least in December, um, which was sooner than we realized. So let's revisit what we've been asked to do to slow the spread of this virus. So as we became aware that this virus was um, spreading across the globe and was here in the United States, um, we were immediately asked to do a number of different things. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that the messaging around the mitigation efforts were challenging in the beginning. Because scientists have learned more about the spread of the virus, um, what is causing the risk, you know, what is causing the spread of the virus, who is at most risk, some of those early messages were not as clear as they could have been and have resulted in some confusion. And while this can be frustrating to observe, it should not delegitimize the ultimate message because scientific discovery is a process. And as scientists have learned more and more about how the virus is spread, their message has changed appropriately. So I think it's important to acknowledge that early on the World Health Organization did not recommend um, universal masking, um, but as we became more aware that the likely cause was through the spread of respiratory droplets, then universal masking was recommended. So we've been asked to wear masks, we've been asked to engage in physical distancing, we've been asked to engage in a higher level of hand washing and hand hygiene. The important thing about the face masks is that you'll likely see and have seen some discussion or debate about their effectiveness. And there have been several studies that have shown either through um, computational mod modeling or through laboratory studies that even if an individual mask that is worn by one person is not 100% effective, let's say that mask is only 50% effective, if everyone were still wearing a mask that was partially effective, that could still reduce the morbidity and mortality in those communities by up to 50%. So if you hear somebody talking about how a single mask is not 100% effective, that may be true, but even if those masks are not 100% effective, universal masking is still very important because collectively that helps reduce the transmission and thereby reduces the likely deaths as a result in those communities. And so while we, we, we know that now, um, that message can be difficult for health communicators to get across to the public um, for those people who might be resistant. So we've been asked to do a lot of things to respond to the virus. And so where I wanna spend some of our time today is talking a little bit about how that has impacted our behavior. And so I think one interesting place to start is to look at Google. So you can go in yourself to Google Trends 
Um, and you can look at a given day, you can look back at the whole year, you can look for specific topics, and you can see what the trends are that individuals across the country and across the world are searching for. And so if you look at the year of 2020 as a total, in the United States, these were the top five searches and the top five um, news searches that were conducted through the Google platform. Um, and you can see that coronavirus, the coronavirus update and coronavirus symptoms were all in the top five searches for 2020. And that when you're looking specifically for news articles, coronavirus, stimulus checks and unemployment, all topics that are related to the coronavirus pandemic are all in the top five. So clearly this has impacted our online shop, our online behavior and what we are spending our time thinking and worrying about. You can also scroll down and look in more detail about what people have been searching for. And so the, in the beauty how-tos, how to cut men's hair is the number one search. And I am guilty of being in that category myself. That's a picture of me cutting my son's hair. And I have never cut hair before. I, I should keep my day job as a professor because it looks like his mom cut his hair, but I did. Um, you searches for how to color your hair at home, how to wash your hands, how to make hand sanitizer, how to make face masks. All of these were in the top five for the entire year of 2020. And so it is clear that the country responded to the recommendations and we're looking to make behavior modifications as a result of those messages. Um, and, and this is an important indicator of the fact that most people were responsive to the communications that we were receiving from our healthcare professionals and through our public health professionals. But you can also look a little deeper, and I know this slide is a little bit busy, um, but I wanted to highlight a couple of things. This graph shows over time in the United States some search trends that originated in January of 2018, that's the far left-hand side of your screen, all the way to um, January of 2021. So this covers multiple years, and you can see how the trends of searching as they related to coronavirus symptoms have emerged over time. And it may be difficult to see, but I also have highlighted the search trends specifically for the state of Iowa. So you can see all 50 states um, represented on that graph, but I've highlighted the state of Iowa so that that stands out just a little bit more. The data trends all begin in 2018, and so you can discern the changes over a longer period of time rather than just looking at 2019 and 2020. Um, and you can see that some of the searches are legitimate um, indicators of coronavirus, such as the term fever. And so you can see that in the lower right-hand corner table, the search for the term um, fever um, it fluctuates, it goes up every January, 2018, 2019, but that in January of 2020, it increased a whole lot, up to eight times more than the normal change that you would see. And so you can see that people were searching for terms related to the coronavirus. You can also see on the top right-hand corner, a search for a term that was not commonly used in 2018 and 19, and that is the term anosmia, which is the loss of smell, and that jumped 20 to 60 times higher than normal starting in January of 2020, and then of course it tapered off over time. But given that this was a unique COVID-19 symptom of the loss of taste and smell, this makes a lot of sense. And so we can see that people are searching for terms related to those physical symptoms. But I think what's really interesting and important to also note, and I'm going to circle back to this a little bit later in my talk, is some of those searches for terms that are not necessarily directly related to the physical illness of COVID-19. So you can see that there's a lot of searching going on for terms like depression, anxiety, and alcoholism. And those are ways that we can get or looking at that is a way of giving us a hint at how people are feeling and responding to the coronavirus. And I'm gonna to touch on that in a few slides. So kind of an interesting non-academic way of looking at this is to look at how our shopping behavior has changed. Certainly all of you and I have changed my shopping behavior. Um, I don't make frivolous trips to the grocery store to try to reduce my interaction with people outside of my household. Um, I'm not gathering in restaurants. Um, and I personally love to eat out and I have not eaten out since last March. Um, so these changes that I have experienced are reflected here and what you have likely experienced if I look at trends in shopping and commerce. 
And so the slide on the left is looking at general commerce um, sales patterns and percent change over time. And so you can see that when um, through March and April, things like groceries, wholesale, big box stores, um, those all spiked and went up and grocery sales increased the most because as we started to realize that schools and workplaces were likely to be going into some form of lockdown, um, Americans responded by stockpiling supplies. And I think none of us will ever forget the stockpiling of toilet paper and, and how you couldn't find toilet paper and paper towels or disinfectant wipes. So grocery sales spiked immediately after this became after we knew we were going to have to make some changes and then they leveled off over time um, and we can see that reflected through May of that year in that slide that it kind of went back to a more normal pattern. One thing that has not returned to normal is restaurant sales and these sales are split on this slide based on the type of restaurant. So places like fast food or fast casual dining have been able to shift some of their approach to delivery or curbside pickup and they have been able to improve a little bit over time. But places like fine dining, which really rely on an in-person presence, have not shown that same recovery. And so I think this is really good and bad news, right? There's a mixed message here. What I'm focusing on is the good news in terms of people's response to the recommendations. So this is data that shows us that people are taking the recommendations to socially distant, to not go out in public, very seriously. Now, does that have a negative impact on the, the economics of the country? Absolutely, and I'm not going to go into that, but I'm trying to paint a positive picture of how, in general, we have responded by changing our behavior in pretty drastic ways. When you look at the grocery sales through January, you can see, again, that they spike a whole lot in April of 2020, and they've leveled off, but they're still higher than in years prior. Um, and they've come down this year. They've dropped, um, they've dropped by about 2% this year, but this is a graph that extends that prior graph into 2021. So I think what will be interesting for behaviorists to look at is how are, how is our behavior sus change sustained over the coming years? And I think that we don't know the answer to that yet and only time will tell. The slide on your right hand screen is looking at food delivery. So when we're looking at the economics of, of how we have changed our purchasing habits. Um, one area that has really thrived during this is food delivery services because many consumers have shifted from eating out to eating at home, but they still want food that they didn't have to cook themselves. So that um, rate of increase has gone up over 500% um, through May of last year, and it tapered off a little bit, um, but that was a, a boom for that industry that had obviously not been anticipated. So I want to take a quick step back in time and I'm going to go back to 2018. Um, there was a study published in 2018 in the journal called Emerging Infectious Diseases. And this was a study conducted by the Harvard School of Public Health and they did um, a pandemic influenza survey of nearly 5,000 people. At the time the survey was done, it was a completely hypothetical scenario of how Americans would respond to a potential um, influenza pandemic. And so in our public health preparedness work, um, the, the, the country and many states have run um, preparation models for how we would respond to an outbreak of influenza. Um, nobody, of course, could have anticipated this current situation exactly as it is, but we were looking, they were looking at how Americans reported as a self-report for a hypothetical influenza outbreak. And there's two points I want to make about this earlier research. So first, it's all based on a hypothetical outbreak of influenza. And what's unique about that, or how that's different from what we're talking about today, is that influenza is um, an illness and a virus that we're all familiar with, right? We all know about the flu. People get flu shots. Um, flu season is common vernacular. So this is something that um, we're already aware of. This is not a new or novel illness like the SARS-CoV-2 virus is. Secondly, in this study, Participants were asked about potential behavior changes, but the longest length of time that was proposed for these behavior changes was three months. So that's very different than what we've experienced that has been going on for a year now, um, in that this is a much longer lasting um, experience that we're all going through than the way this study was framed. 
Nevertheless, I thought it was interesting to point out that through this hypothetical scenario, participants were asked how they would respond to public health recommendations in the future if they were asked to do so. So they were asked to do things like, would you follow the recommendations of public health officials for one month? Um, would you avoid air travel? Would you avoid public events? Would you avoid going to malls or department stores? And what's interesting about this is that in general, when asked about this a decade ago, Americans largely said that they would be willing to comply with the recommendation. So yes, they would be willing to avoid going to church service or avoid contact with people outside of their household. And I think it's really interesting because that was a purely hypothetical study that was done um, a few years ago. But now we've been asked to experience that very, um, a very similar scenario. So the tables on your slide here are from a study conducted and published in the journal Frontiers in Communication. And the purpose of this study was to explore a natural sort of before and after experiment. So it's quasi-experimental design for those of you who are keeping track. Um, and this is a pre-post sort of look. What happened is that some researchers at Yale and George Mason University had conducted a survey or were planning to conduct a survey of about 5,000 people across the United States. The original purpose of the survey was to explore participants' media consumption habits, trust in various um, sources of information, personal values, political beliefs, and to ask which specific disease prevention efforts people were taking in response to the COVID-19 outbreak. This study was initiated on April 3rd of 2020, and they had collected data from about 1,700 people in that study on April 3rd. But then there was a natural change in the environment in which the CDC issued a formal recommendation that people begin wearing masks in public in the evening of April 3rd. So then the data that was collected on April 4th, 5th, and 7th suddenly had a, um, a change in context. And at, in that evening of April 3rd, the CDC came out and um, issued this recommendation and news organizations, all of them began to cover it. And what, what you can see here is that even in that short period of time, there was a marked increase in the people reporting that they would wear and purchase a mask, and it increased noticeably. And of course, it's important to mention that these changes, while noticeable, they did, they, while they are noticeable, they did differ based on a number of factors that I don't have time to go into, but they differed based on race and ethnicity, income, education, political affiliation, and geographic region. And on the right side, uh, so, so these studies ha are more nuanced, but I'm reporting basically the pre-post change. And the important point I want to make here is that, again, we see evidence that people are largely responding appropriately to the recommendations from the health officials. And so um, I think that's really encouraging. What you can also see from the same article is patterns of YouTube, news, and Google searches on, that, um, on April 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th. Um, the same period of time as the research study. And you can see that as these recommendations were coming out from the news sources, you see this um, similar evidence that people are then going to search for that information to try to get a better understanding. So again, there's strong evidence that people have responded appropriately to the recommendations that they've been given. So that, that so we have a hypothetical study that took place in the past we have a real-time study showing us how people are responding to a recommendation right when that recommendation is being given. And now I want to talk a little bit about an observational study that happened a little bit later in time. But this study was take, um, took place in the Midwest, but um, it's a study published th um, by Marquette University. The data was collected all in Wisconsin. And this was a common, um, what I'm showing you here is the observational research. So researchers who conducted the study went through a uh, went to a variety of locations in public spaces in Wisconsin, in rural, urban, and suburban areas, and observed whether or not people were complying with the mask recommendations at the time, or whether they were um, complying with the mask requirements. So in early June, the June 3rd through 9th period of time, this was after the CDC had recommended that individuals wear masks when out in public, but before there was any mandate to do so. And so what's interesting here is you can see 40% of the observations showed that people were wearing masks about 40% of the time. And that's markedly lower 
then the compliance that would have been, that you would guess we would have based on the study from 2008 that said the vast majority of people, 80 to 90 percent, would comply with a variety of public health recommendations. So that hypothetical study is not exactly um, coming to fruition in this real world context, which is slightly different. So before there's any ma mask mandate in Wisconsin, about 41 percent of the people that were observed were wearing a mask. And what we can see though is before um, there was then an increase in the number of mandates. So there was before the store mandates, with store mandates, and then with eventually with state mandates. Um, and what you can see is that over time with increasing recommendations, people are increasing their compliance. And when there was a state mandate, there was still a very small percentage of people who were not wearing a mask or who were wearing it incorrectly. And I think this is really interesting because it really speaks to one of the fundamental um, conclusions from social psychology, which is that people are influenced by their surroundings, often more so than they realize. And so this just really speaks to the impact that mask requirements can have. And while I know that gets into um, political discussions and can violate some individual sense of personal freedom, the end result is that over time people do comply with these requirements um, and people are generally pretty responsive. And the response is greater um, when the masking is has been required. And I chose this study because it has a nice snapshot over time, but also because it's from Wisconsin, which has many geographical, socioeconomic, and geopolitical similarities as those of us who are living here in Iowa. So it's a nice comparable um, ex to explore how it might be different for us or how it might be similar to our friends and neighbors who are in Wisconsin. So the main point, though, is that mask compliance goes up when, the, when people are forced to, which makes a lot of sense. So again, I think one of the main takeaway messages from that prior work is that individual behavior is indeed affected by our surroundings and by others. And that is really the root of social psychology. Social psychology is the science that is predicated on the simple fact that human thought, emotion, and behavior are powerfully affected by the real, implied, or imagined presence of others. And this quote from 1954 is very famous in my field, but it really speaks to the fact that my individual behavior is profoundly impacted by those other people who are around me, but they're also profoundly impacted by the real or imagined presence of other people. So our emotions and our behaviors can be influenced by other people, even if they're not physically present in that space with us. But I think what's really important is that we see that human behavior through shopping and our mask compliance has been impacted by the pandemic and by the recommendations that we've received. But it also has really impacted what what we call a fundamental human motivation, and that is the need for belonging. The need for affiliation, acceptance, and bonding is a fundamental human need in social psychology. And in, nine, the, in 1995, a psychologist named Roy Baumeister published a study where he and his colleagues identified and really articulated that fundamental need for affiliation and acceptance and belonging. And the reason that I bring that up in this context is because the trends that I have shown earlier highlight how that while people have searched for terms that relate to the coronavirus and why we've complied with mask mandates and we have made major changes in our behavior, there is a real impact and not always positive on that very basic human need for affiliation, um, for human connection, for friendship, um, and for belonging with our, with our peers. So, we have been asked that in order to keep ourselves and our loved ones safe, we've been asked to do a number of drastic changes, including closing schools, closing childcare options, employment, employment situations have changed for folks. Many people have lost their employment. Those who have been lucky and fortunate enough to maintain their employment have experienced drastic changes in working from home oftentimes while also taking care of those children who are not in school. We've been asked to confine to our homes and any and all of this is likely to result in emotional distress. And emotional distress is a completely appropriate reaction to this major life-changing event. 
We have been asked to isolate from our loved ones, our friends, our families. We've stopped going to social events for work and play, things that brought us joy, and all of which goes against that very basic human need for connection and belonging. A review of recent studies published in the New England Journal of Medicine revealed that taking um, psychological data from people who had experienced quarantine for various reasons, not just related to COVID-19, was able to show that people who have been quarantined and isolated, um, particularly at risk are those who are healthcare providers, but those individuals showed a number of emotional outcomes, including stress, depression, irritability, insomnia, fear, confusion, anger, frustration, boredom, all of those emotions have been documented in the literature as a normal result of quarantining and social isolation. And so what I really want for you to understand is that a certain degree of this is very normal. I know that I have experienced some of those emotions and insomnia, which I've never experienced before in my life during this past year. Um, so all of that is very normal and it's an appropriate response to a big life event. With that being said, there are very real psychological concerns that really do need addressed by healthcare professionals. Appropriate intervention and assessment by mental health professionals is very important. And it's a really difficult time for that because while the healthcare system is overrun and overburdened and taxed by the viral outbreak that we're experiencing, they also are going to be needed to juggle some of the uh, mental health crises that people are facing and that are very real. So I wanted to highlight all of the ways that our behaviors have changed in positive ways, but also highlight that it is very appropriate and normal that there are some negative outcomes and that if you are somebody who finds yourself in need of some emotional support, some psychological support, um, there are resources available that I want you to be aware of. So the first one is the National Alliance on Mental Illness, which has a strong partnership with Des Moines University. Um, they have a website with a number of really great resources. So if you feel like you or someone you know could really benefit from some support, um, I recommend reaching out and looking at the NAMI website. But I also know that not everyone has access to the internet. And you can call the state of Iowa 211 line to find additional resources in health and human services. Um, so I want to make sure that everyone is aware of those resources. So the, the point that I think I, I, I resonate with when I'm thinking about all of these changes is that we are, as a species, very resilient. And I think there are lots of reasons to be hopeful and optimistic. And so that's the note that I'd like to end on today. Looking forward, we have a vaccine, multiple vaccines that are available for us now. We have survey data that shows us that about 50 to 70 percent of adults are willing to get the vaccine depending on the specific circumstances and there are of course a lot of individual differences in that. As of today, when of this recording, which is February 3rd, there have been 27.2 million people who have received at least one dose of one of the COVID-19 vaccines, and over 6 million people have been fully vaccinated. The, t the graph on your left shows you the daily average vaccination rate, and they are giving, as of today, about 1.3 million doses per day on average. So any public health professional will tell you that the rollout of the vaccine has been somewhat difficult and challenging and not exactly as smooth as it ideally would have gone. The good news is that there's a vaccine and once we can reach herd immunity, which is at least 70 to 80% vaccination coverage, then we can start to resume some aspects of normal life. And that is a really good reason to be positive and to be looking forward to the future. So I thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for attending and thank you for um, the questions that you'll ask afterwards. We appreciate your, you connecting with us at Des Moines University. Um, and I hope that this was beneficial for you. Um, and I wish you well and I hope you all stay healthy and um, reach out if you have any questions or would like any additional information. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you so much, Dr. Reimer. I know I certainly enjoyed your presentation and I hope the rest of you that tuned in did as well. Um, please join us next week. We have Fritz Nordengren,
who is presenting on technology and his presentation is entitled, Does Technology Connect or Isolate Us? I think it's going to be so interesting. Um, and that is next week on February 23rd, or you can watch it later at dmu.edu slash mini med after the premiere. Um, of course, every week I am going to challenge you to share one thing that you learned today that was cool or interesting um, with somebody else, whether that's a colleague, a friend, a teacher, um, just share with them something that you learned from this presentation. Um, and I hope that you all send me questions. Um, I will be forwarding those on to Dr. Reimer. I will get you answers. I know that for me, this presentation definitely sparked some questions in my mind. There's definitely things that I would want her to expand on um, that kind of sparked my knowledge. So if that was true of you as well, I hope that you send those to me. I will be looking forward to reading them. Um, so please send those to questions at dmu.edu and we will put up the slide that has the email address on it right after this. Thank you and see you next week.